Hi, hi everyone. Good morning and good evening to whichever part of the world you are in. A very warm welcome to each one of you. I'm Chanukya, founder and uh, founder of DeFi and host for today's uh, discussion with Niels. And for those unattended, DeFi, DeFi is a global community started with a vision to educate and build AI for everyone to solve meaningful problems. And in our constant endeavor to give back to the community, we regularly conduct boot camps, live sessions from industry experts, data thons, and other events. And today's interview with Niels from AETA is one such initiative where we would be trying to know about a novel initiative that is being run under uh, AETA. And our heartfelt gratitude and thanks to Niels for making time today. And with that, we will kickstart the discussions. Maybe Niels, if you can help us introduce about yourself to the community, that will be great. And uh, we would love to learning more from you about the project and what kind of contributions you're making out there. Thank you. Thanks for joining in. Good morning. Thank you very much for having us. Um, really appreciate this. This is a great opportunity. So I am Niels. Um, I'm working for ATA. We are a research institute based in Shenzhen, China that has developed the technology and the methodology to forecast earthquakes up to a week in advance. So basically, um, through um, our technology, we have developed a sensor set uh, and we are using the data that is collected together with AI uh, to forecast the epicenter, the magnitudes and the occurrence of earthquakes. Thanks. Thanks for that uh, brief introduction, uh, Niels. And also, uh, can you tell us, like, you know, what it means to you for uh, work, working for such a great initiative? Uh, well, this is groundbreaking research. Uh, this could basically save thousands of lives and, and billions of economic impacts. Uh, so I think this uh, this is technology and science being used to actually make a big difference in the world. Um, and, and that can be good for everyone. Earthquakes is one of the very few natural disasters that are still not that very well understood and for which there is no forecasting or really mitigation. So through this, we can actually make a huge step forward, uh, especially for those countries that are still developing and that are uh, a bit more vulnerable to this, uh, to this risk. Yeah, true. I mean, I'm, I'm totally aligned with that. I think it's, it's a massive... Uh... A problem that you're trying to solve because we see a lot of human beings being displaced and also uh, due to earthquakes a lot of economic impact is there displacement is there and people die also in in the case of worst earthquakes uh, but yeah i mean that that's something that's novel that you you are doing you and your team uh, very very appreciative of the work that you're doing out there and also uh, i'm sure like you know there must be a a team that is sitting out there, but uh, just wanted to understand, like, you know, how big is the team and in, in what way you are contributing to the initiative? What is your role there? Yes. So ATA is actually part of Peking University Shenzhen Graduate School in Shenzhen, China. Um, so everything is very academic. We have two leading um, key people there. So we have Professor Wang and Dr. Yong. Uh, they are leading uh, this research institute. Um, they also have a team of, of experts, so both in um, seismology, but also in AI and computer science. Um, and, and next to that, there's also a supportive team. So I'm helping uh, with partnership developments and business developments. We have uh, Frederick, who's very strong and leading the marketing uh, and supporting me in business development. Uh, and we also have a partner called SGV, Stringent Valley Ventures. They are, uh, they have been a partner for many, many years and they are supporting also um, ATA in, uh, in the design, development and production of these sensors. Great, uh, glad to know that. And also, uh, I'm sure right now there must be some systems that are already installed uh, at the disposal of governments or any bodies who are tracking or forecasting earthquakes, right? So what are those that are there right now in the market with the governments and how AETA is different from them all? So indeed, we actually are already forecasting for local governments. So what is really so interesting is this is not just an idea or a wish to develop a, a forecasting system. 
uh, we have been doing this already for um, four or five years that we are delivering forecast uh, to local governments. So at the moment, we have about 300 sensors that are deployed in China, mainly in Sichuan and Yunnan province, because that's way more earthquake prone. Um, and every week, we are delivering a forecast to the local governments. We are saying that there will be an earthquake in the coming week or not, uh, and they can use this to actually take the right measures in case uh, an earthquake is forecast, right? Uh, according to the magnitude and the epicenter, they can take the right decisions and uh, they have uh, put policies in place. Um, so with these sensors, what we do, uh, we have about 300 of them. We have deployed them in um, a chessboard like grid. So uh, we really have a network of sensors, which is um, one of the keys to actually do earthquake forecasting. When you look at other solutions in the market, uh, they mainly uh, are alert systems. Those are sensors and also positions uh, at fault lines or places where the earthquakes mostly happen, but they only work when an earthquake actually occurs. So they are actually only capturing uh, the waves or the signals of the earthquake and then sending a signal to, um, to the people that are close by. So basically, if you live very, very close to the epicenter, it doesn't really make a difference because by the time you actually get the message and everything is processed, the earthquake already arrived where you are. If you live a bit further away, you do have some time, let's say 30 seconds, 40 seconds, maybe up to a minute, but nothing longer. So that's so it's helpful, it's useful, but it's not enough. It's, um, uh, it, it's, it's a great step forward. However, we took this way further. We are actually forecasting days up to a week in advance so that governments, people, anyone involved can actually take the right steps, uh, prepare uh, and make sure that the damage is reduced to a minimum. Earthquakes is something that we can't, uh, we, can't we cannot avoid them, uh, but we can do mitigate the risk and the impact. Totally, I mean, like, you know, there is a massive difference out there. Uh, I mean, you are actually, predicting seven days in advance in comparison to the existing solutions out there, right? Like, you know, which are basically predicting 30 seconds or maybe two minutes in advance. But yeah, I mean, that, that's very noble to know. And uh, with that, I have a follow-up question. How simple is it to integrate AETA with existing hardware that are like, you know, existing solutions that are already there with the governments or the local bodies? And can you give us a use case where you might have worked on it? So what we can do is we can use the infrastructure of other installations, other sensors that are placed. Um, it's, it's really hard to really integrate completely in another sensor because the sensors we have are unique and they're capturing, capturing um, a huge amount of data that we need for earthquake forecasting. Uh, what we have done is um, we, we have partnered up with um, a research institute in the Middle East and we are using the stations um, that you know seismology stations uh, across the country. We are just adding our sensors uh, next to it because what we do need is a safe space, secure space to deploy the sensors. Uh, we need electricity, of course, and we need a uh, data connection. So it is useful if we can just reuse the the infrastructure that's already there for all the other sensors that are placed. Could also be uh, weather stations, for instance. Got it. Understood. And and now that you have already done some uh, real world pilots, uh, how are they working? How are they functioning? And I also see sometimes on your uh, uh, LinkedIn pages that like you know you have been able to predict with uh, this much accuracy and all. Can you walk us through uh, how are the pilots going and how are they functioning and what are the results that you are already producing out there? So in short, what what we do is we deploy our sensors. So our, when we talk about sensors, we have um, we have designed a sensor set and one sensor set uh, consists of three parts. Uh, we have an electromagnetic sensor, we have an acoustic sensor. Those are buried underground, so about 1.52 meters underground. So they are very shallow buried, which makes it very easy for deployment. And they are connected uh, with the terminal box. This terminal box is placed uh, above ground and it will actually collect the data from those two sensors. It will do some pre-processing and then send everything to our clouds. In the clouds, um, we will run our algorithms to actually do the forecasting. So that's all happening automatically. Uh, and once the forecast is made, we always make them in China uh, every Sunday. Uh, we are delivering this to the local governments. 
we are always giving uh, imminent uh, forecast. So that means we tell them whether or not there will be an earthquake. We don't give any probabilities. We are not saying there will be a 60% chance. Uh, we don't do that. We very specifically say there will be an earthquake um, here that strong at that time. Um, when we look at what you know, how how we have been delivering results, um, uh, we are expanding to other countries. So, for instance, I mentioned uh, the Middle East, but we are also talking to other partners um, in, in Asia and also in Europe. Um, what we want to do is, whenever we deploy sensors, uh, we we need some time to to collect data. This data will be used to tailor our data models, our algorithms, and then we can actually start predicting forecasting for the end user immediately. So we don't need a lot of time. We need about six months uh, on average, depends on the data, uh, to actually from, from deployment to giving forecast. So that's pretty fast. Uh, and again, that's why the sensor network is very important as we have multiple sensors placed in just both like grid. Uh, and ideally they are placed about 20 to 50 kilometers apart from each other. Um, that would be perfect. So that's what we call the density in the network. We can also go a little bit further. So it has a reach uh, or of about 100 kilometers. Uh, but ideally, they are, they are placed a little bit shorter or closer to each other. Um, but when you look at it, if you take an average of 30 kilometers, which is in the middle of 20 and 50, if you place a sensor every 30 kilometers, you can cover a huge amount of, of area um, with just a few sensors. Um, so basically, we are reducing the cost as well. Our sensors are not that expensive compared to other sensors in the market or in the world. Uh, and they are designed this way that we can, with a very low cost, we can cover a huge area. And it's important because we have seen many times is that different sensors are, are and let's say there are a few sensors close to each other. The anomalies or the precursors that they are capturing can be very different for every sensor. So that's why one sensor is not enough. No matter how accurate, no matter how sensitive, or no matter how precise that one sensor is, we believe it's not sufficient to actually do accurate earthquake forecasting. So that's why we go for a network of sensors. Yeah, totally. I mean, uh, thanks, thanks for that uh, elaborate answer. Actually, my follow-up question was uh, on the sensors, but I think you have already elaborated well on. Uh, uh, how the range of sensors work and, and what are the different best practices that are you, you are adapting. Now, with that, like, you know, that's completed, right? So just wanted to, just curious uh, about uh, how do you plan to make the solution scalable and that would cater to a much global audience, right? So how are you, what are your uh, next steps in order to globalize this? I, I We understand, I mean, like, you know, you have already put it in the Middle East and uh, in some Asian countries. So what are your next steps to globalize this product solution? So before, as, as I just mentioned before, we always wanted to go international and make this technology available for every earthquake prone country. So that's why we have designed the sensor this way that they are very affordable and easy to deploy. Maintenance is, is basically almost nothing. Uh, we have never had an issue with sensors in the past 10 years. Um, on the other hand, uh, we are reaching out to partners. These, these can be academic partners, uh, other research institutes, uh, universities, but we're also looking at governments. So we really want to offer this kind of service to governments uh, because we believe that you know, this is a technology that should be used by governments uh, to protect its uh, citizens. Uh, so we are actively reaching out uh, through different channels uh, and, and we, ha we still have the ambition to deploy our solution, our technology in every earthquake pro country uh, in the world. Um, so as, as I said, in Asia, we are expanding. Uh, in Europe, we have started uh, conversations with, with local governments, uh, the Middle East, and uh, hopefully a very next step will be South America. Great, great. Glad to know that. And also you spoke about uh, sensors, right? So you, you mentioned that you have... Uh brought in cost effective sensors so that it can actually be scaled to any any country out there which is which is very noble but can you walk us through how have you built these sensors in in, in collaboration with someone or how did you make it more cost effective that way so the sensors are designed by the founding team um, professor wong and dr yo 
um, they are experts in, in, in building sensors, um, electronic design, and they have partnered up with Shenzhen Valley Ventures to actually make these sensors. So Shenzhen Valley Ventures is um, a, a, a hardware manufacturing company, uh, but they are focused on innovation. They are focused on really high tech. Um, they don't do mass production. They do mostly uh, small scale production. Uh, and, and they have worked together. And they have uh, used their expertise to improve the design, to uh, make sure that there is a design that is uh, very scalable and uh, affordable. And then through them, they have been able to deploy uh, across China. Got it. Understood. And that that's uh, that's very interesting to know. I mean, uh, that you have collaborated with a partner to bring such kind of a novel solution. And right now, I'm sure, like you know, you have entered into the market, and uh, also there might be some resistance or to adoption, and also like you know, there could be a lack of awareness. So, what are the key challenges that you are facing currently for adoption? The key challenge is indeed is to overcome the the controversy um, about earthquake forecasting, it's a quite sensitive topic. Um, even though we everything we have done is scientifically proven, it is still not that easy to actually um, get the people on board in the story and let them take the step um, to, to give this a try. So even though we, we have a very low burden of at least trying this or doing a pilot, uh, it is hard to actually uh, convince the people to, to trust this system. Um, that is why we, we are very lucky and grateful that we have been able to do this in China. For several years already, we have been delivering forecasts uh, also with the responsibility of giving the correct uh, data to local governments. Um, and uh, we, we have been able to prove that we, we can do this. Our results are stable, our results are very strong, and they continue to improve. Uh, we have been able to lift the global accuracy in earthquake forecasting from about 30% to over 70% in just a few years. Um, and data collection is key. So if we can expand in other countries, we can also uh, improve our forecasting models dramatically because we also have seen already that um, the data we capture in other countries is very different uh, every time. So there, there are some similarities, but there also are also differences. And that way, the more data we have, the stronger we can make our forecasting models. Yeah, totally. I mean, that's that's totally understandable. And I'm sure like, you know, the moment we start capturing quality data, uh, our machine learning algorithms will also end up giving accurate results. But yeah, looking forward to more advancements there. Uh, and, and with that, like, you know, can you also explain us what are the challenges you are facing uh, to deploy the solution? As in, like, you know, there might be some ground level challenges that you might face, right, in terms of uh, installing it or anything of that sort. Are, are there any physical challenges that you face at the moment? Uh, physical challenges, not really. Um, whenever we have found a spot where we can deploy, um, it's incredibly easy to just make the deployment. The only thing you need is a shovel uh, to dig a hole. You need a little bit of cement uh, to make sure that the sensors are stable and then they can't move. And then you just have to close that hole again, connect the wires, uh, make sure you have a data connection and electricity. So basically, that's all about deployment. Uh, all the rest, it, it's more like an IoT device. Everything is connected uh, with the clouds. Everything's happening automatically. Um, and uh, again, deployment is very, very easy to do. Um, if we can find uh, the right partner, if we can find uh, you know, the approval or spot to deploy somewhere, uh, it can go so, so easily. Um, we're not talking about the big process. Got it, got it, understood. Yeah, I understand. I mean, like, you know, the deployment time can vary uh, based on the situation to situation and circumstance to circumstance. But typically, how much time does it take to, for deployment and then getting the insights? So how, how many months would you wait to be able to get some solid insights? For deployment, say we take a few weeks to actually find the right uh, locations because we also do um, a little examination of okay, what is the area? Where have we seen earthquakes before? Uh, are there any fault lines? Uh, and so and so on. You have to make sure that you're not deploying it next to uh, a very busy highway, for instance, right? You'll have a, a lot of noise that way. 
Um, but after doing this, this research and investigation, let's say we take a couple of weeks, we talk to our partner, um, it takes a little bit of time. Whenever we have identified the ex exact locations, we either, as I said, we, we use um, a location that's already having sensors, so we don't need a lot of preparation. We can just add our sensors to it. If it's a completely new location, then you have to make sure there's an electricity line or electricity um, yeah, by basically. Um, and uh, for the data connection, we use a SIM card that we can add to the sensor. So that's also pretty easy. Yeah. Um, and then the matter of just deploying, going to that location, you deploy, you, you connect to the cloud, and you have to do some follow-up, of course, in the first stage, just to make sure that everything is stable and, and going well. And then when we look at when we are collecting the data, we on average, we say we need about six months of data collection before we actually start running our forecasting models. Uh, you need a good data set, of course, uh, before you can start giving some results. The accuracy might be a bit lower in the beginning. Uh, and again, it, it really depends on what kind of data are we collecting, how many sensors do we have, is there some activity already from the start, or is it really like a flat line? Um, there, there are some variables, of course. But on, our, on average, we say six months of data collection, and we start giving forecasts um, every single week or day if that's needed. Got it. Understood. That, that's uh, very nice to know. And also, uh, I keep seeing your uh, LinkedIn post on AADA. And I think recently you have forecasted accurately in, in some of the regions in uh, China. So uh, can you tell us like, you know, a bit more about it and how do you communicate with the government or how, how, how does uh, the government consume your information? Uh, maybe it will be, and also it's a, it's a success story, right? Uh, in the sense, like, you know, you were able to predict it and uh, uh, that's very important information. I guess like, you know, maybe you can walk us through, yeah. That. Yes, indeed. Um, I believe it was on Wednesday, the 1st of June, there was a 6.1 earthquake in, in the west of Sichuan, close to Chengdu. Um, as, as I said before, we make forecasts every Sunday for the coming week. And uh, we have forecasted that earthquake uh, as well. So we have forecast on Sunday, there will be an earthquake uh, of that magnitude. Um, and, and our epicenter error was about 50 kilometers. So if you look at what we forecast, we forecast three elements of an earthquake. We forecast the occurrence, we forecast uh, the epicenter and the magnitude. Each three elements, they have an error, of course. We, we, we don't have a 100% accuracy, um, and we, I don't think we will ever have, just like weather forecasting. But for occurrence prediction, we have an accuracy that is higher than 70%. And this is calculated on a very, very long time frame. So we, the forecast of last week is not just a one-time thing. We are doing this every single week already for several years. And over these several years, we have an accuracy that is higher than 70%. I believe it's at 72%, right? So this is not just a one-time lucky thing. We, we have been consistent over a very long period of time. When you look at epicenter error, so how far is our forecast location from the actual location? Uh, we, we have an error that is below 100 kilometers. Okay. So basically it seems like a big difference, but we are talking about earthquakes and huge regions. This is a very accurate forecast. And when we look at the forecast of last week, our epicenter error was about 50 kilometers. So that's already very, very accurate. Uh, and then you look at magnitudes error, we have an error that is mostly, normally, usually, um, below one. Um, in the very beginning, it used to be bigger, of course, but over time, we have been improving um, constantly and consistently. So our error margin is, is shrinking um, every single time, basically. And that's the same thing when we look at the forecast uh, of last week. So uh, from Sunday to Wednesday, let's say that's about three days. Uh, three days in advance, we have forecasted an earthquake uh, at that spot very accurately. Uh, so, of course, we, we were happy uh, to share that. We, we yeah. give this to the local government. Um, we, we give the documents uh, stating the exact same thing. So, these three elements are mentioned, and then it's up to the government to also decide, okay, what are we going to do? They, they talk to us also uh, to get some advice. Um, 
are we in a populated area? Um, if, if we are not, then you know there's a very small chance of, of uh, yeah. you know, losing people. Um, or are we close to very important infrastructure? Do we have to stop the train, for instance? Uh, so these are things that they are then taking in account, and, and they can take the right decisions. So we are providing them with with information, and then it's up to them to follow the policies that they have written and and to act accordingly. Yeah, totally. I mean, that, that's that's very nice to know. Of course, I mean, we can't stop a, a natural calamity, but I think we can at least stop the destruction that it can cause. And I think uh, that is where uh, the insights that you're providing by using AI is, is super helpful. And I'm, I'm glad, I mean, like, you know, I'm glad this is happening. And also, I'm sure, like, you know, you'll be able to uh, forecast many more and save millions of lives out there. Uh, with that, I mean, I think uh, we had a very uh, great collaboration with AETA. Uh, since the time we have been speaking uh, since January 2021, I believe. Uh, can you explain in a few words how the collaboration uh, with DeFi has been and like, you know, how it was uh, resourceful in the context of the competition? We would be glad to know your insights there. Yeah, exactly. As I said, we, we, we've come a long way already, uh, I think we can say. Um, we, we started collaborating in Deeds, um, mainly through the competition that we organize every year. So what we do is we invite universities, students, researchers, um, AI specialists, basically anyone who's interested to use our data and to also start forecasting uh, earthquakes every single week. So we are giving them um, a basic data set and every single week, so once the competition started, every single week we are giving them the data of, of, of last week uh, and they can use this to train their 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 models and, and we are looking like okay this is the region we are monitoring um let's see what actually happens every week they have to deliver the forecast for the coming week and then we can see whether or not their forecasts uh, were accurate or not um, and we made this a competition we really wanted to challenge uh, people uh, but we also wanted to show that the data we are collecting is actually or the, the data and the methodology are actually the right way forward in, in earthquake forecasting and of course, through DeFi, we have also been uh, been able to expand uh, our audience, right? So in the beginning, it was mostly focused on, on China, um, but that year in, in 2021, indeed, we have uh, decided to go international and then through DeFi, we could uh, reach out uh, to a huge amount of people uh, like on top of that. So, and the more people we have, um, the, more, the more input we have as well. I believe I can't recall that we had over 1,000 uh, people joining in. Uh, yeah. I think it's way more. Uh, yeah. yeah. Also, to thanks for your contribution. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that, uh, Niels. Thanks for your kind words. And I'm sure, like you know, many more thousands should join in in this uh, edition competition as well. We'll pass on the word, and and I hope uh, many thousand teams uh, participate in it and get to know and uh, get to be aware of what's happening and how they can contribute to such a noble cause. And thanks for bringing in uh, such kind of great competition uh, research work to the world. Uh, we are very thankful for it. And also before we sign off, any quick thoughts that you would want to share with the audience would be happy to know. Um, it's more on a personal level, but um, to anyone who's watching this, if you have a particular interest in, in any domain, I would say don't hesitate to talk to the people, uh, give it a try. Um, we have, you know, good things always take some time um, and a lot of energy. But if you believe in a certain cause, I would say go for it. Um, talk to the people, help with them, uh, spend some effort uh, because there are some great initiatives uh, going on that are firstly very interesting and challenging, but on the other hand, are also uh, making a great impact in the world. Uh, whether it's earthquake forecasting, whether it's any other disaster, whether it's technology um, to help elderly, to help um, maybe the, the very small kids or, or young people. There, there's something for everyone. Um, and uh, I would say go check out the, the platform, uh, DeFi. There are a huge amount of interesting challenges that, that you can contribute to um, and, and learn a lot. Um, it, it's not only it's, it's a mix of, of learning, of, of you know having a great hobby, uh, but also in, in helping and making a very good impact. 
great thanks thanks dan uh, neels uh, it it was great learning a lot of things about aeta and uh, we are looking forward to sharing this with the community and thanks thanks for your time on a, a saturday morning and uh, have a great rest of the day thank you yeah thank you so much thank you for having us